morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Continuing this morning with our series, kind of working our way through the minor prophets, and we're almost to the end. We're today looking at Zechariah, next to the last of the minor prophets. He's a contemporary of Haggai, the ones we looked at last week, both of them pretty much dealing with the same issue, and that is rebuilding the temple after they got back to Jerusalem from uh, their exile. Well, Kathy and I, and I've mentioned this, I think, before once or twice, but we lived in our little Papua New Guinean village out in the middle of the jungle for a couple of years when the villagers came up to me one day and asked if we'd help them build an airstrip. They'd wanted an airstrip for years, and they figured that, well, with us leaving here, maybe, or living there, maybe they would have a chance to, to get that done. And we agreed that if they provided the labor, we would provide the financing, we would provide the technical expertise, and uh, I would do what I could. Um, partly because not only would it give them access to government services like schools for their kids and medical care and business opportunities, things like that, but it would also help us. Uh, to get into our village, we either had to take a lengthy canoe trip and walk in the last five or six hours or take a very expensive helicopter. Neither of those options were good. So um, we all needed an airstrip. The only problem was we surveyed a whole bunch of different places in the area. There was only one suitable place in the entire area that was long enough and wide enough and level enough for an airstrip. Unfortunately, it was an area that had never been cut. Nobody had ever put a garden down there. And so it was virgin uncut rainforest. And I don't know, you probably have all seen a documentary on the Amazonian rainforest with the huge trees and the vines and the critters and all that. That was it. Um, just, just, you know, the Papua New Guinea rainforest, just like that. Huge, huge, huge trees covered the area and every one of these was going to need to be chopped down, dragged off, and then all of the root systems would have to be dug out because you can't have roots in there going soft. Uh, uh, make the airstrip uh, problematic. All of that would have to be done before we could even begin leveling out the ground and getting it ready for the plane to land. So we surveyed the area, we marked out the boundaries, and then we went up and climbed up a hill that overlooked the area. And I just looked down on all those trees, thinking to myself, man, I don't know. I just, I don't know. Um, this is the biggest project I can even imagine. Where do we begin? How do we do this? How are we going to get all of that wood off of that airstrip? Do we even have the capability to do it? A local Catholic priest who was working in the area came by and he went and saw where we told him we were going to put the airstrip and he come up, he come up to me later and said, you know, five years from now, you guys are still going to be working on this. <laughs> And uh, that was pretty much the, the consensus of everybody around. The other villagers said, ah, they're, they're building an airstrip there. Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, everybody just kind of laughed at us a little bit. Unfortunately, we didn't have five years. We had just a few months to get it done. You know, reading through Haggai last week and Zechariah this week, I wondered if they were feeling a little bit the same way about their project. You know, by God's grace, the people had been allowed to return to Jerusalem and they've been tasked by God with this very important job of rebuilding his temple. And he was making it very clear to them through Zechariah and through Haggai that this was high on his priority list. He kind of got on their case last week about, you know, you guys are making some nice houses for yourself, but my house is sitting over here, it's just a pile of rubble. And, uh, you know, I talked about last week the people's lack of progress in doing this and tackling this project. And then, so think about this week, maybe part of it was, it just was like our airstrip project. It was so overwhelming. You know, building one's house, their domicile, that's one thing, that's manageable, that's doable. You know, get some neighbors together and you pile up the rocks and you do whatever you need to do and you make a house, but the temple, that was formidable, that was huge. So Zechariah, he, he looked at the rubble that had once been the Temple of Solomon, and he's contemplating, 
this job, when he's thinking about the resources at hand, at his disposal, and he's thinking about, I'm sure, the opposition of the people uh, to this project. Like I said last week, you know, the locals didn't want this redone. They didn't want Israel to be reestablished in all its power and glory. That's the last thing they wanted. Not, I'm thinking Zechariah was thinking about like I was when I'm sitting up on that hill looking out over that, those trees. And man, I don't know. This is huge. How do we even begin on this thing? Do we even have the capability to do this? The reason I think he was wondering about these and asking these kinds of questions about it is because God directly addresses these questions in the book of Zechariah. And he gives Zechariah a series of visions. And this morning I'm going to focus on the visions that God gave Zechariah that are recorded in chapter 4. Because I think it directly addresses this whole idea of making the impossible possible. So let's read Zechariah chapter 4 together. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it, with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my lord? He answered, don't you know what these are? No, my lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, as Zerubbabel was heading up the project. Not by mind, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And you probably are familiar with that passage. It's pretty, it's pretty famous. He goes on to say, What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that reigns throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, don't you know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. And I think this message, and we're going to be looking at this today, I think it's very relevant to you and I today. And it's relevant to anybody who is attempting to do great things for God. I think it applies directly to us as we strive to build this church, as we strive to grow this church. You know, we'd all love to see this church grow. We'd all love to expand our ministry into the community. We'd all love to see lives touched. We all love to see people coming forward in the morning to give their lives to Jesus. See them growing in their faith and growing in them, discipling them. Basically, we want what God wants for this congregation. But you know, it could be very easy to be like Zechariah, like the people, like me standing up on the ridge overlooking that airstrip. We just focus on the challenges. You know, we're, we're few. We don't have a lot of resources available. Even if you start focusing on all the reasons why this is going to be a hard job to do, the challenges can seem pretty formidable. It'd be easy to think, you know, I don't know. How do we even begin? Do we have the capacity? Do we have the capability to do this? So let's take a closer look at chapter 4. I'm just going to just look at some key verses in this. And we'll see how God responds to those kinds of questions. And where I want to start is with verse 6. And I think verse 6 shows us that the word of, the work of God is not limited. It's not dependent on our resources or our lack of resources. So he said to me, in 4 6, so he said to me, This is the word of the Lord of Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Solomon's temple, the prototype of what they were trying to rebuild, was a formidable building. It was like 180 feet long, was 90 feet wide, made of stone, was 50 feet high, two and a half stories high. The, the highest point on the temple was 200 feet high. With all of the resources that Solomon had at his disposal at the height of the power of the Jewish nation 
It took him seven years to rebuild that or to build that temple. You can imagine that the that ragtag group of Jews just newly returned from exile. You know, just a shadow of the nation in, in Solomon's time, surveying this scene and surveying the, the, the scope of this task, could have felt overwhelmed. I mean, they had to have felt overwhelmed. You and I would have felt overwhelmed. Any normal human being would have felt overwhelmed. And it would have been very easy to become discouraged. You know, it's one thing to talk about it and get it all rah rah about rebuilding the temple when you're at home in your in your house in Babylon, and you know it's all kind of conceptual out here. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna get back and we're gonna rebuild the temple, and won't it be great? It's another thing entirely when you're standing on that pile of rock and rubble and looking around, going, "Oh man, this is gonna be hard." It's into this situation that God speaks to the people through the prophet. And he says. And he's talking about power and might. In this context, power refers to military power. And uh, might <coughs> refers to human resources. Military power is important because there's <coughs> opposition from the locals. And at, at part of the time when they're working, they would have one hand on the spear and the other hand on the tools. And they're, they're just people guarding them while they're working because they've got these, this, this outside opposition and so God is telling you it ain't by your military power that this is going to happen you don't need a military force to overcome those people and yes he's all he goes on and says you don't have a lot of human resources available your numbers are few but fortunately it's not by those things it's not by mind it's not by power that your success depends your success does not depend on having an abundance of resources it just depends on having me you know, when we were building the airstrip, we felt overwhelmed a number of times, maybe daily, I don't know. And the first time was when we contemplated those dozens of monster trees scattered around through that five, six acres that we were going to have to clear. And then all the host of smaller ones. We had about 30 guys. We had two chainsaws. Nobody had ever run a chainsaw but me before. We had a bunch of axes and six acres of virgin uncut, untouched rainforest. We started by dedicating the site to the Lord and his work and asked for his protection. And that's another story I'll tell some other time. And then we began the task of cutting. And I love this because the guys made a, made a game out of it. You see, all these trees went up huge, high, massive trees, but they were all connected with vines. And these vines had grown up and they just interlaced all of these trees. And so, what the what they did, you know, I lost my place. Ah, there it is. Okay, sorry. I, I printed on front and back this time, so now it's all just messed up my whole system. <laughs> um, so <coughs> they, they made a game out of this. And that is, how many trees can we get to come down at one point? And so they'd cut a tree, and it could crash into the next one and be tied up with vines. And then they'd go and cut that one and another one, and those would crash into the next two, and then they'd be there. And then they'd cut a few more, and those would crash over. And they'd get 8, 10, 12 of these trees, all just kind of hanging on to, and all being held up by this one key tree. And then, I don't know how they selected this guy, but he would run in with his axe and he'd start chopping on this one key tree and everybody else would be kind of standing back, <laughs> waiting. And when they heard the cracking started, they'd yell and the guy would run off and they'd wait a little bit. <sighs> Didn't fall. Back he'd go. <laughs> and the cracking a little bit more, pretty soon all of them would come down at one time. Wham! You'd get this 8, 10, 12 monster trees all falling at the same time. They're like, hey! okay, we got eight that time. I bet we can get 10 the next time. And in that way, by making a game out of it, they did the whole thing in like a month. So you cut every tree in that place with axes, basically, in a month. So, you know, the first truth that Zechariah proposes in this section is that when we're doing God's work, and I think this applies to an airstrip, it applies to a temple. It applies to building a church. Our success is not a factor of our available resources. Because ultimately, 
God, the king of the universe, is our resource. So ultimately, we have at our disposal the resources of heaven in anything that we attempt for God. God has given us everything we need right here, right now, in this place, among these people, to accomplish what he's calling us to do. It's not in us. It's in him. It just remains for us to move forward and to do it. The next point that Zechariah makes in verse 7 is that the work of God is not stopped by seemingly insurmountable obstacles. And there Zechariah says in verse 7, Where are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shout, God bless it! God bless it! The mountain here, he's not talking about a physical mountain. It's a metaphor for a mountain of difficulties, a mountain of challenges, a mountain of opposition. For the Jews, the mountain was the opposition of their neighbors to the building project. So like I say, they had to work with their one hand on a weapon and the other hand on a tool part of the time. And for the Jews, the mountain was their lack of resources, their lack of personnel, their lack of economic resources, their lack of a military, the lack of things that you would normally think that you would need in order to do a project like that. That was their mountain. And God speaks into this situation with the two images. That the mountain of difficulty will be leveled. The temple will be completed. And it's that vision, I think, that inspired and that moved the people and the project forward. Because that vision, the day when Zerubbabel holds up the capstone, the final stone of the temple, and the people shout, God bless it, God bless it, it's that vision that keeps them engaged day after day after day. You know, after we cut down all the trees on the airstrip, that was the easy part as it worked out. It was time now, time now to get rid of the, the stumps. And I had purchased a mighty Ford 1910, 32 horsepower, four wheel drive tractor. And that's what we were gonna use. I was a city guy. I didn't know anything about tractors. I could make it go backwards and forward, and I could lift the blade up, and I could do all kinds of wonderful things, but I had no idea of its capabilities. So I had these delusions or illusions of grandeur about what that tractor was going to do. So we went down there the first day of work on these stumps. I had a big old logging chain. Went and found a stump that was about this big around. Threw that logging chain around it, hooked it to the back of the, yeah, Mike's back there. <laughs> <laughs> All the farmers in the place are going, oh, yeah, they know what happened. I threw the logging chain around that, hooked it to the back of the tractor. We got it taut. I threw it in low, hit the gas, and I don't even think I, I smudged the bark on that tree. It just sat there. Okay. I'll find a small one. So I went and found one that was you know, about this big around, threw the logging chain around it, nothing. I found a smaller and smaller. Finally, I found one that was about as big around as my arm. <laughs> wrapped the logging chain around it. Hit it. Pulled it out. Yay! <laughs> yeah, we got it. We got it. Yeah, we got it. And then I looked at that sea of three foot six. We had some that were eight and ten foot diameter stumps, and my heart just sank. I mean, I've just proved to the entire group of guys here that my tractor's going to be pretty much useless. <laughs> and uh, how are we going to get those out? I was wondering at that point, you know, had we bitten off more than we could chew? Was the priest right? You know, were the other villagers from the surrounding villages, were they right? Was this going to be our mountain? Well, three months later, the stumps and roots are gone, and I'll tell you how in the next section. But I think the one thing that kept us going through this whole process was that vision. It was that vision. Like, you know, Zerubbabel standing there with the capstone in his hands and the people shouting, yes! Well, our vision was the airstrip, uh, airplane landing, and the guys talked about it a lot as we were working for those five or six months that we were working on the strip. That, ah, that day when that airplane was going to land on our airstrip. And it's, that's what kept us focused. You know, I think we all dreamed a little bit about that. All of them. And that's what kept us moving forward. And I think it's the same way when we come contemplate our construction project that's right here. You know, like I say, it'd be so easy to focus on our lack of resources, 
basically build this mental mountain of all the reasons why we're gonna stay the same size or we're gonna, you know, basically not grow. And I think that's death to any project. Because when people start focusing on the negatives, when they start focusing on the mountains, when they build these mental mountains, people lose the will to even start. You know, in missions, we use something called appreciative inquiry. And it's a, kind of a methodology for getting people to dream about their possibilities. And what we do, we get a group of community members together, and we say, okay, here's the rules. We want you to talk about all of the capacity, all of the capability, everything that you have going for you in this community that we can apply to this project. Now, one rule. I don't want to hear anything about a problem. I don't want to hear anything about an issue. I don't want to hear anything about a reason why we can't do this. This is all about positive things. It takes a while for people to kind of get into the mode because we're so we're so kind of keyed to looking at all the all the negatives first. But okay, once they get into it, they start exploring. Yeah, we've got this, we've got that, we've got this, and we've got this person, and we've got these resources, and they start dreaming and they start exploring and they start thinking about what can we do with all of this stuff? And almost every time. And I love this exercise because almost every time, at the end of the session, the people are feeling encouraged and they're feeling empowered because suddenly they've got a vision, something that they feel like they can, they can focus on and they can accomplish. They've started thinking about the possibilities and they've stopped thinking about the mountains. So, you know, for our project, this is where the focus needs to be. Every time I talk to others about our church and people ask me regularly what, what we're doing, where we're preaching, and that, I, I, I talk about this this congregation. I say basically the same thing every time. I say, you know, we're small in numbers. We run, you know, 25-ish on Sunday. We don't have lots and lots of people. But it's a healthy small. And that's my phrase. It's a healthy small. We have a wonderful thing here. You know, some churches this size are just kind of going through the motions until the last person turns off the lights. That's not the case here. We have a great mix of people. We've got younger people. We've got older people. We've got families. We've got kids. We have a great sense of community here. We have people who are steeped in the word who really understand God's word and how to apply it to their lives. We have that, that could be great disciplers for newer Christians. But there's a lot to build on here. And I think this is where our focus needs to be. Because if we focus on these things and the vision that we're hoping to achieve, and I walk through, every time I'm here by myself, I walk through this church and I just pray that God one day these pews are full. One day, these pews are full of people worshiping, praising, ministering, and just living their lives in the presence of Jesus. And that's my vision. And I'm not just waiting for the day that God, and I think he already is, is moving us in that direction. So, you know, like I say, if we focus on these positives, and the vision that we're hoping to achieve, we're going to level up that mountain. The third point that Zechariah makes, or that God makes through Zechariah, is that the work of God is built on our small acts of obedience. Zechariah 4.10, verse, verse 10 says, Who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel back to that vision again. But to get there, and I love this phrase, who dares despise the day of small things? At some point, the Jews began. They cleared the site. They salvaged the materials they could. They quarried what they needed. And then stone by stone, hammer blow by hammer blow, the temple slowly began to take shape. And it wasn't the result of any big thing. It was the result of small act after small act. And I think that's what God is saying. Don't despise the small stuff because it's on, this, on the back of the small stuff that we're going to achieve the greater vision. Together, those small things began, became the temple of God. To get those stumps out, we made small things out of big, big things. The guys, bless their heart, they chopped those stumps, every one of them, using chainsaws and axes into manageable pieces. And by manageable, I mean manageable on a little tiny tractor. 
And I ran around with the jet tractor and the logging chain and pulled out those pieces one by one and dragged them over to the side of the airstrip. And it was by that process, one piece at a time, one stump at a time, that we were able to get all those stumps and all the roots out. We had several teams working simultaneously, six or eight guys on a stump, chopping and cutting. And as soon as one was ready, I'd go over to the logging chain of the tractor, pull it out and drag it off. And about that time, another one would be ready, and I'd go over there and hook it up and pull it off. And, you know, just the whole day was spent there, day after day after day. And we were knocking out 100 meters, 100 yards, basically, a week doing that. In just a few months, we had the entire strip cleared by making big things into small things and tackling the small things. You know, there's no book magic bullet for building a temple or an airstrip or a church. I wish there, what I mean by that is, you know, there's no single big thing that we can do to make our vision happen. Yeah, I wish there was. You know, the Jews weren't gonna call temples are us and order up a prefab and get it delivered and slap that baby up and be done with it. It was gonna require years hard work, stone by stone by stone. You know, I remember many times thinking, uh, I'm sitting on top of that little 1910 with my 32 horses, thinking, man, you know, a D9 cat, a grader, maybe an end loader, we'd knock this baby out in a week. But we didn't have any of those things. We had a little 32 horse fort. And uh, even if we had, you know, looking back on it, it would have robbed the villagers of the amazing sense of completion when they finished that project and that airplane landed, because they did that. And for years afterwards, years and years and years, maybe decades, I mean, that was their claim to fame. We built that. When everybody said it can't be done, we did it. And I was just so, I was just so proud of them. You know, it's the same thing with growing a church. It'd be easy to think that if we only had, you know, fill in the blank, a better preacher, a praise band, uh, different facilities, da 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 you know, we could all fill in the blank with something. You know, if we only had something else, we could do this. And I think often people who think this way are disappointed when they actually do get whatever filled they filled in the blank with and nothing much changes. I know churches that have gotten a praise band where they didn't have one before and Three months later, it's the same group of people. You know, there, there is no magic bullet to make this happen. No magic pill. What it comes down to, and I love this phrase by Eugene Peterson, I think I've mentioned before. What it comes down to, for you and I, doing, it, doing the job that God's called us to do, is a long obedience in the same direction. And what Eugene Peterson means there is that it, what, it, what it comes down to is that it's a day-by-day -day life of obedience, doing the small things don't despise the day of small things. Doing the small things that God has called us to do. That's how we're going to grow this church. That's how, we, that's how they built the temple. That's how we built the airstrip. That's how we built the church. A group of people living up the life that God, God has called them to do. <coughs> being faithful day after day after day in the small things that God has put in our paths. Finally, in verses 8 and 9, Zechariah says, our, uh, he points out that our faith and obedience are what releases the power of God to accomplish the work of God. It says in verses 8 and 9, Then the word of the Lord came to me, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of his temple. His hands will also complete it. Then he will know that the Lord Almighty has sent him to me. He said, this is going to happen. There's going to be a temple here one day. Zerubbabel's going to hold that capstone in his hand and he's going to set that capstone. And when that happens, you will know that I have been in this project. It is proof that God has made it happen because that's the only way it's going to happen. It's the only way it's going to happen. There's only one thing that could have torpedoed the rebuilding of the temple, and that's the lack of faith and disobedience on the part of the people. And lack of faith is the result of a mountain focus, you know, looking at the difficulties, looking at the obstacles, taking our minds off the vision, taking our minds off the resources that God has given us. If the people had focused on the mountains, they probably wouldn't even have started. Lack of obedience is simply an unwillingness to do the hard work that God has called us to do. 
There, you know, there's nothing easy about building the, building that temple. There couldn't possibly have been anything easy about it. I'm sure it was hard, hot, physical, sweaty, nasty work without the benefit of ibuprofen, where at the end of the day, they were just spent each and every day. It would have been so easy, you know, somewhere in that process to say, forget this. I'm going to go back and work on my house. You know, I think we saw the same thing with that airstrip. I think that was probably the most physically demanding thing that I that I could have imagined, and certainly the most physically demanding thing that I've ever done. I remember we started the project, it was still a rainy season, every day it would rain, every night it would rain, fill up all the holes that we dug around the stumps with water, and these guys would be half submerged in the mud and the muck, digging out these roots and re tying the chains around it, and you can imagine it was 95 degrees, hot sun during the day, and it was like just working in a sauna day after day after day. It would have been easy to say, you know, using that helicopter is pretty sweet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, kids don't need school that bad, do they? Uh, it would have been easy to say, no, it's, it's the same thing with building the church. You know, God's calling us to a long obedience in the same direction in order to make this happen. You know, it would be easier not to engage in it. In my experience, there's often a lot of disappointments associated with evangelism and discipleship, and you probably experienced it too. You know, you, you just invest your life, time, energy in people month after month, and you see them kind of get a glimmer, and they start attending church, and you think, man, this is great. Their lives are being changed. God's touching them, and six months later, they're just gone. You don't even know where they went. And, you know, you do that often enough, you get a little bit disappointed. Emotionally, it's a lot easier not to bother. But it's in bothering. It's in doing that hard work. It's in that long obedience in the same direction, continuing, even in spite of the obstacles, even in spite of the disappointments, to continue to do what God calls us to do, to reach out to our neighbors, to just talk to people, to tell people our story, and what, what God has done in our lives, just to invite them to be a part of our fellowship, and just minister in the name of Jesus. It's in that that the resources of heaven are released are marshaled and committed to our work. And it is in that, that, that faithful obedience on the part of God's people that stone by stone, his church is built. When we, are, when we do our part, God does his, and the result is the evidence of his presence and his power. You know, I've talked about some pretty big projects this morning. Can you imagine the celebration in Jerusalem when that final capstone was set? Oh man, I bet they partied for a month. And uh, yeah, I can, I can imagine a little bit because it was, I think they probably felt a lot like we felt the day the air, airplane, the first airplane landed in Pasikawa. And the entire language group, there were only like 2,000 people in the whole language group, the entire language group was there. Everybody was decked out in their, in their finery which for them was leaves and feathers and stuff, bones and things, you know, I've got some pictures, it's pretty amazing. They were all decked out in their traditional finery. We waited and then we could hear that airplane coming down. And, you know, we could hear it out there and there. We could see it and finally it come around the circle a couple times to make sure everything looked good. And it came in and landed, nobody said anything. Nobody said anything until it pulled, it turned around at the far end and it came up and it, it stopped right in front of where we are. And that place exploded when all of those people realized their vision had been achieved. The airplane had landed. And it wasn't just the airplane. I think it was, you know, the schools and the healthcare and all the things that that meant for them. That place came apart. Um, think of how we're going to feel one day when our vision is fulfilled. We walk in room, come in here on Sunday, and instead of 25, there's 125, or even 100, or even 80. <laughs> when we see, you know, God bringing people to an understanding, knowledge of Him, and faith in Him, and people growing in Christ, and getting new families, and children, and kids running around, God's ah, going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I hope God gives, gives Kathy and I the longevity, if that's what it takes, to be here for that. Because it's going to be, we're going to party for a month. <laughs> so, you know, it's easy, 
it's easy to fall into the trap of focusing on the challenges. We you know we are few, we yada yada yada. It's easy to build them off. Um, but yeah. I'm never gonna turn on about front deck. <laughs> but you know, I am looking forward to seeing this church become everything that we've got in Christians. I think it's gonna be incremental. You know, it's not going to be, we're not going to show up next week and be 100 people there. It's going to be a day when we're 27. It's just going to be bit by bit, person by person, family by family. But like I say, there's no reason on God's green earth that we can't experience it. Because God's going to provide the resources. There's no mountains in our way. The only mountains that are in our way are the ones that we mentally construct. There's no reason that God won't level whatever mountains, whatever challenges there are. We have the capability of doing the small daily tasks that he calls us to do. He's not calling us to, you know, throw our neck on our chopping block. He's just asking us for day-by-day -day obedience and faithfulness to his call. You know, it's all up to us. It's all up to us in our faith and our obedience. And I think we can achieve this vision. And uh, let's just make it happen. Let's pray. God, we are thankful. We are thankful for your power, your presence, the vision that you've given us. Boy, I think every person here shares that same vision. One day we come, there is, there's 75 or 80, 100, 120. It would be nice if we had a big building program someday. We could just outgrow this place. So we don't know where, you, where your vision ends, uh, but uh, we just want to be a part of it, God. So we invite you to, you know, if there's areas of our life that we need to, they bring into better alignment with what you're calling us to do, those small things day by day, living out the presence of Jesus and ministering to our neighbors. If there's things that we're not getting into that you want us to, bring it to our attention because we're about this. We want this to happen. And uh, we pray that, that you will work in us, through us, in spite of us sometimes, I suppose, but just work to accomplish this vision that we can grow this congregation we can be the people in the church that you call us to be. We commit this into your hands, Lord, and we expectantly look forward to the day that the capstone is set and the vision is achieved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.